Hello, friends. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whichever part of the globe you are in. Hati, welcome to today's session. Team, learn from the legends and NNF next. Thank you profusely for joining us today. It is a huge honor for us to have you all, your continuous presence in all the sessions in our series. Today, we have a state-of-the-art lecture on a topic that is comparatively new to most of us, fetal neurology, the current landscape and the path forward by a true expert in this field, Professor Sonika Agarwal. We have Dr. Somashri Rai from Kolkata and Dr. Agash Pandita from Lucknow to moderate this session as well. Hati, welcome both of you. Now to introduce the faculty for today, Dr. Agarwal is an assistant professor in neurology and pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and trained at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas uh, Children's Hosden. In fact, to be honest, she's such an illustrious legend that uh, I have uh, two pages of her uh, bio sketch here with me, but uh, we are eager to hear from her. So I'll just uh, summarize it by saying that with a background of over 14 years in maternal fetal medicine, combined with several years in pediatric neurology, as well as fetal neonatal neurology, she has that unique dual expertise in brain focused care in the perinatal period that we do not see in anybody else. So, of course, the legend for today, she is the right person to tell us more about fetal neurology. Hearty welcome, Professor Sonika Agarwal. Over to you, madam. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. I will just share my slides. Yes, it's working perfectly. Okay. Um, can you see like the whole slide show, show advancing? No. I can. What about uh, others? Agash, Somashri? Are you able to see? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Good evening, sir. Yes, yes. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Yeah. We can see. Yeah, it's clear. Let's start. Great. So I'll give an overview for um, uh, the field of fetal neurology and how uh, initially, obviously, for many decades, our um, assessments were based on when the baby was born, right? And uh, now, gradually, the field has um, evolved into fetal neurology with explosion in the neuromaging, um, the genomics, and infectious testing, and all the prenatal advancements that are there that help us uh, make a diagnosis in utero. So I'll give an overview of the commonly seen conditions um, and um, in 40 minutes as much as I can cover how we go over the counseling process um, and, um, and about the development of the fetal neurology consortium and some of the current work that we are doing. So um, if you uh, focus on neonatal period, so this is like from the global burden of disease uh, study where disability adjusted life years, the DALIs in the first 28 days of life are as high as 40%. And um, throughout the lifespan, this goes um, to various conditions in various age groups, it's about 10 to 15%. But you look at the burden of disease in the neonatal period, and majority of it is due to prematurity and uh, neonatal encephalopathy. But gradually we are also understanding a large number of these uh, infants who are born encephalopathic, the origin of that condition could be from the prenatal period. Now, if you look at the full field of fetal and neonatal neurology, uh, it starts with the assessment from the pregnancy about the pregnancy conditions, any obstetric complications, history of any exposures, 
any other high risk pregnancy issues such as multiple pregnancy, preeclampsia, diabetes, and then other toxic exposures, nutritional disorders, mental health disorders. Then the field of understanding of placental um, problems, placental ischemic or infectious, how the placenta impacts the growth of the uh, baby and the fetus is also increasingly being understood. Um, and all these conditions can be diagnosed prenatally through imaging or uh, ultrasound or fetal MRI. And then there is this uh, smaller percentage where problems around the time of delivery and birth can lead to an infant being born encephalopathic. And babies, um, through our assessment in the newborn period, we know babies can present with encephalopathy, seizures, stroke, prematurity-related complications, exposures to drugs and toxic medications, and due to other medical disorders or genetic disorders. So um, focusing on the field of fetal neurology and what has changed in the last two decades and which continues to evolve very rapidly, and there's no standardized guidelines or um, the process of counseling. Every center is uh, very their own center-based or expert-based. So it starts with the uh, anatomy scan that happens, and then the patient gets referred for a fetal MRI. And uh, increasingly now, um, infectious testing, testing for CMV, toxoplasma, parvovirus, Zika virus. So all these have evolved in the last few decades. Uh, amniocentesis could be done even for genetic panels, be it a focused gene panel or a whole exome sequencing. And studies have shown, if you see to the right of the slide, uh, how uh, whole exome changed the management or the prognostic counseling process even during um, early in pregnancy um, in the second and third trimester sometimes. And um, as we see um, uh, weigh in all the imaging, the infectious, the genetic testing, there is a complex counseling process with a team of specialists. So including the obstetrician or maternal fetal medicine specialist with the fetal neurologist, the genetic counselor and any other specialties based on what the uh, diagnosis in the uh, imaging uh, is related to a cardiac disorder or renal disorder. So those specialties also get involved. We, uh, the complex counseling process is done planning for delivery and then follow up of these infants and the long-term um, early intervention process. So whenever we meet a patient in the prenatal period in pregnancy, um, after the imaging is done, the labs are available, all this information is integrated to discuss and um, they have questions about the delivery, what is the timing, what is the location, perinatal monitoring continues through by the OB and the MFM teams and other consultants get involved. Our focus as neurologists is mainly in integrating of the neuroimaging, the genetic testing, the prognostic counseling process and what this could mean over um, years as their baby matures, what are the neurodevelopmental challenges they could have, the early intervention and the multidisciplinary or multi-specialty follow-up that is required. So I'll be discussing um, some of the recently seen cases over the last few years and trying to give you an overview of the common conditions. Ventriculomegaly uh, is the most common condition and um, it can be either due to an infectious cause such as CMV, toxoplasma, parvovirus, Zika and others. Um, it could be unknown virus. Sometimes on amniocentesis, we cannot test for every possible thing. So um, you see here on the fetal MRI, these are the expanded ventricles. This is the postnatal MRI. And um, this child was um, had a full genetic testing, whole exome was non-diagnostic, got a shunt at 30 days of life um, due to building up of the intracranial pressure, has needed one revision, has been enrolled in therapies, and she's um, doing very well developmentally and has had a single seizure um, in the setting of an illness. So we are continuing to follow and she's about four years old now. However, ventriculomegaly is very heterogeneous. The, in the same scan with a similar looking MRI, you could see more profound developmental challenges. This is just one example that I have uh, presented. And um, now looking at another cause where there is obstruction, the aqueductal stenosis. 
So these children, um, sometimes they, these uh, fetuses can be diagnosed very early. The cortex could be even more thinned out. And there is a range of outcomes with the risk of 50 to 70% of neurodevelopmental delay, global developmental delay. There could be risk for seizures, shunt procedures, and then any worsening and shunt revisions. And then obviously, with the if you see the long-term follow-up, some of the recent studies have shown as many as 50 to 60% of these infants, uh, these children, as they grow into adults, may need um, supports for education, for employment, for continue with headaches and other uh, issues related to their disability. Now, this is an example where um, as the baby grew uh, postnatally on the follow-up in the neonatal scan, the aqueduct seemed to be patent and uh, did not need a shunt, had um, mild to moderate developmental delay. And uh, with the occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy still is doing speech therapies in the early school years. Now, this is another example of mild ventricular medley. So this patient we met uh, in pregnancy, very late in pregnancy. You see the maturity of the cortex here. There's uh, several uh, cortical folds. So she was in her advanced 35 or 36 weeks of pregnancy. On though the ventricular medley was mild. However, you see, you focus here. These were thought to be choroid plexus cyst or uh, possible septation. So we did counsel about the risk for possible CMV. Um, the CMV testing, um, IgM was negative, IgG was positive. The avidity was, um, it was inconclusive um, and it wasn't thought to be that there was an infection. However, when this baby was born, uh, the baby had uh, frank CMV features of petechiae and mild hepatomegaly, um, ended up mm, getting treated with Valgan cyclovir for um, about six months. She's been enrolled in early intervention. She had um, lots of balance and um, coordination issues, motor delay, speech delay. Um, she's uh, walking and talking at three and a half years old. She's fully conversational. She's starting to read early, but she has lots of hyperactivity. And um, if you look at the white matter here, the white matter is thinned out and there's some mineralization in these two pictures on the right. So um, started out with um, challenges, but overall is catching up and doing well. And this was a CMV with mild ventricular medley with some septation seen who presented late in pregnancy. So prenatal counseling for ventricular medley, which is one of our most common um, conditions we see, it, uh, degree of ventricular medley is one uh, uh, point. However, a presence of additional anomalies, other systems or other structural anomalies such as um, cortex. Uh, so if we are doing a fetal MRI early in pregnancy, um, if you see in the uh, scan where the ventricular medley was severe, the cortex is stretched out thin and the cortical development is not complete until the term gestation. So um, we cannot predict fully whether there is going to be cortical malformations or not. So that has, that has always to be included in the discussion process. And then a full chromosomal genetic and infectious analysis through amniocentesis is recommended. However, when not done, then based on the postnatal scan and exam of the baby, then further testing is uh, planned. And then progression over time is obviously a high risk factor for ventricular medley. The other common condition we see is um, prenatal ventricular hemorrhages. So if you see this area here started out with one um, big hemorrhage, possibly involving the white matter, there's this expansion of the ventricle on one side, not on the other side. And then later in pregnancy, seem to have a small hemorrhage on other side, ended up delivering around 37 weeks or so. This is the neonatal MRI. You see one ventricle is more expanded. Uh, this child also ended up uh, needing a shunt and is being followed, the genetic workup, the collagen mutations, whenever you see white matter injury or uh, parenchymal hemorrhages, collagen mutations are commonly um, being tested and we are increasingly diagnosed them, uh, diagnosed them in um, prenatal period and also in the postnatal period. These are the cold 4 a one and two, and some other genes have also been reported to be associated with these um, prenatal hemorrhages. And um, 
this infant is also enrolled in early intervention. However, um, um, is already talking in phrases at about two years of age and is doing well and has not had any seizures so far. Now, um, the prediction part is challenging because the one is the development of the brain is still ongoing in pregnancy. So if we look at a scan in mid-pregnancy, the cortex and the layering of cortex is still evolving. We do not know how the ventriculomegaly will progress with time. And also it is unclear uh, because the developmental spectrum, there is always a range. We know that for milder ventriculomegaly in 10 to 12 millimeters, uh, if no other infectious or genetic cause is found, 90% of those children can do really well and could have a normal favorable outcome. Whereas with moderate to severe ventriculomegaly, 70 to 90% will have some developmental challenges. So if you look at these scans, they are very similar looking and look at the size of the ventricles, slightly more here. Now this child um, did, um, um, ended up having good motor skills, but speech and language delay was severe and autism was diagnosed around two to three years of age and has not needed a shunt. Whereas if you look at this scan, um, here the early shunting was uh, needed because of um, pressure, walked at 16 months, had normal speech and has had a single seizure with fever. So you can really see how the spectrum of the outcome is changing, um, even with a similar scan. So it's very difficult to um, base the exact prognosis um, of the percentages and the exact, sometimes families will ask the exact percentages of what their IQ will be, how much delay they will have. So that is always a challenging answer early in pregnancy based on just a fetal MRI. Uh, overall, long-term uh, hydrocephalus and ventriculomegaly, approximately 40 to 50 percent can have a normal intelligence if they're in the absence of other structural anomalies or genetic causes. Seizure and epilepsy risk is high and um, shunts on an average are revised two times in the first um, 10 years or so. The maximum risk is in the first year, risk of intellectual disabilities there. However, with rehabilitation, early intervention and educational supports, if started early, these children may lead uh, fairly normal lives. Now, looking at collagen mutations, the col 4 a Now, this is a scan you um, see here, a big area, um, huge ventricles. There's some um, hemorrhage here. Uh, you see this dark area on the right. and um, this um, child was born, had seizures at birth. Uh, we had a prenatal diagnosis of collagen mutation as the cause for the hemorrhage, uh, has global developmental delays, enrolled in rehabilitation therapies, and um, also has some vision issues based on this white matter injury in the posterior tract uh, fibers. Now, um, this is another collagen mutation. The destruction of the brain matter here is uh, huge. So you see this big area of the porencephalic cyst injury, which is bilateral. You see these scattered hemorrhages on both sides, the big area of porencephaly um, on both sides. And you see some cerebellar injury and hemorrhages also, which can be seen in the collagen mutations. Um, this infant was severely delayed. Uh, there was bilateral extensive injury. Um, cold 4 a was diagnosed postnatally and uh, had, had spastic quadriplegic CP and also intractable epilepsy and finally ended up on hospice care and passed away at 22 months. Now, um, again, uh, looking at the fetal MRI, this is a recent consult I saw. I just added the slide yesterday. So it's uh, relatively early in pregnancy. You can see the brain is smooth. It's about 22 weeks. And there was this one big area of porencephaly on the left side. Um, the only positive history was um, uh, COVID infection at 14 weeks gestation. And um, there's this area of hemorrhage here leading to the porencephaly. And if you look at this last picture on the right, there's a little area of porencephaly that is forming on the other side. So I have seen some call for A's where there has been focal injury on one side. However, with this early in, um, uh, indication of the injury starting on the other side, here the outcome could be more severe. So really it's early in pregnancy and the, it, you really have to see how this progresses over time. 
Now, um, this is another um, patient who was seen recently. If you look at this fetal MRI, so the whole brain is um, replaced by cystic encephalomalacia or the older term is porencephaly. So there's this huge cystic areas of empty pockets of fluid, dilated ventricles, brain tissue is really thinned out and injured on both sides. And if you focus on this temporal lobe here, this was like a um, uh, arteriovenous malformations or AVM. And there was history of multiple members with HHT or hereditary hemorrhagic malinjectasia, which uh, is, has a high incidence of um, arteriovenous malformations and cerebral um, AVMs have reported in 10% of these cases. This baby um, is um, still a few months old and has had some embolization procedure for the AVM, um, but the outcome for this baby is um, for this uh, prognostically, you will be discussing spastic, quadriplegic, cerebral palsy, um, high risk for seizures, possibly even feeding issues, breathing issues at birth. But she did relatively uh, very well and did not need any support in the newborn period and uh, went home in a few days. But the long term neurodevelopmental outcome will be challenging. Now, the other common condition is the midline um, anomalies, the agenesis of corpus callosum. You see the connection here is missing and the ventricles, they appear uh, like the deer horn or stag horn um, orientation with parallel orientation of the ventricles. The, with agenesis of corpus callosum, there is a wide spectrum. Uh, there could be children with milder delay and milder um, uh, speech and motor delay, some right-left coordination issues, learning disabilities. However, they could be the other side of the spectrum where these children could have more profound delay, especially when there is an association with a genetic syndrome or a associated cortical malformation. So um, this picture on the right is actually of a uh, snapshot of a functional MRI. Researchers, there's these early studies which have come where they're trying to understand um, what is the difference some of these children are doing so well where there's no other brain anomaly, but this whole big pathway of structure with connecting the right and left is missing. How are these children doing so well? And in the functional MRI studies, they found that um, the intrahemispheric connections, if you look at the image on the right, um, were strengthened. So the intrahemispheric con connections were strengthened when the corpus callosum was missing. Um, and this was probably the explanation uh, where um, these kids were doing relatively uh, well. However, this study just came out, and um, I actually gave a talk to the uh, um, in the American Academy of Neurology conference last year, uh, uh, last uh, week, where it was a room full of adult neurologists, and so we I was trying to focus more on the adult outcomes and how these children do over time. And this is a study which is recently one of its kind published, where they interviewed. It's uh, it was done in Australia. And they did eight interviews with adults aged 23 to 72 years who were living with um, disorders of corpus callosum. And they talked about their challenges. So they may not have a visible disability. They may be walking and talking, but they have learning challenges. They have executive functioning challenges. They can have speech, um, um, speech errors. They can have language processing disorders and comprehension issues and also social um, uh, awkwardness and social issues. So um, these adults actually brought out um, several challenges that they were facing and um, access to education, uh, inclusion in the society and uh, employment. So they, they uh, the conclusion was that there was absence of su uh, supports in key life domains. And we, we may focus a lot on the uh, early education and um, special education in school, but how they integrate into the society is also important as, as they grow into the adult, identification of um, as an adult, as an independent member of the society, and, and the understanding of the clinicians, the educators, the families, the peers, and the employers regarding these issues, how to support them. So there were several great ideas that came out from this study and also the idea how to include, um, include the patient perspective for these children as they grow older, if they could share their perspectives to be involved in research. 
Now, um, the other, um, uh, uh, discussing about the challenges. So this is a patient also who was seen early in pregnancy. So this is around 21 weeks of pregnancy. The brain is smooth. It is supposed to be smooth. The, the layering of the cortex doesn't form. Um, she had another ultrasound where the ventriculomegaly, so colpocephaly or ventriculomegaly is usually associated with the missing corpus callosum because there's just empty space and the atria, they expand, especially in the posterior part. However, um, so this patient had one ultrasound again, and it was increasing colpocephaly. So we did counsel that um, your um, that the postnatal MRI will guide us. There's a chance we could see cortical malformations. And now look at the neonatal MRI here on the sagittal view. The top picture shows the missing corpus callosum. And here you see the double cortex, which was not evident in this early fetal MRI. So um, the cortical development is not clear, and this baby um, ended up having diagnosis of what we call the double cortex syndrome, uh, which is usually due to the DCX gene, or it is also called subcortical band heterotopia. So it's like double cortex. You see the cortex there, there's white matter, and then there's a subcortical uh, band again. And they have learning challenges. Their seizure risk is very high. They can have behavioral differences. Sometimes girls can do better than um, boys. In the boys, the same gene causes lisencephaly, and this is seen in females. So um, complex brain malformations. Here, the prognostic counseling is uh, relatively more clear. Uh, because uh, with holoprosencephaly or with a dysmorphic brain, so this, this is two siblings. They had the exact same looking fetal MRIs. Whole exome was negative and we could not still find a cause. There was no other infectious or toxic exposures. And so this is the top sibling here and then the um, sister who was born. And there's this big posterior fossa cyst. There's fusion in the midline and there's just dysmorphic brainstem also, and they are both profoundly delayed, um, though they have not yet developed seizures and they follow um, with neurology and other specialties. Um, schizencephaly is another area, which is um, cortical malformation here again, where the cleft is there. It can be due to infection, it could be due to genetic causes, it can also be seen whenever there is an early in utero um, a hemorrhage or a stroke in the area with a hypoxic ischemic insult due to any other complicating factors or due to genetic mutations. And usually these uh, pregnancies, amniocentesis will be recommended. Uh, infectious genetic testing and then the counseling process seizures are almost always there. Um, and then if it is a one-sided cleft, they will uh, usually have what we call the hemiplegic, hemiparetic, spastic cerebral palsy uh, with the other side being relatively um, normal in tone and movement. Uh, but bilateral clefts have also been reported. There are uh, genetic syndromes which are reported with uh, schizencephaly and polymicrogyria and um, associated with those genetic conditions. Uh, posterior fossa is um, challenging on ultrasound. Um, I will just skip to the picture. So um, one common condition we see, you could also, um, the milder um, thing would be cisterna magna, where only there is a big empty space, but the normal the cerebellum and gormis is there. However, this is like a classic dandy walker, and um, both the siblings here, uh, one had cisternum, they both had the 60 um, genetic syndrome. And um, this one infant had this Danny Walker. You can see the cerebellum and gormis. There's hypoplasia. There's a big posterior fossa cyst. Um, the Dandy Walker kids, they'll usually have global delay, um, tone issues, eye abnormalities, nystagmus. Um, they require shunting. They can present with headaches at a later age. Uh, there are some reports of um, uh, cases being diagnosed at a later stage uh, when they present with symptoms. Uh, however, uh, some degree of global delay, um, shunting, seizure risk, hydrocephalus worsening over time, all this has been associated with dating. Now, fetal MRI, um, another indication for fetal MRI is um, twin pregnancy where uh, there is demise of one twin or with twin to twin transfusion syndrome, 
where there is complicating uh, placental circulation, where we suspect brain injury on the ultrasound. And um, there was this um, uh, twin with bilateral strokes and uh, hemorrhagic strokes on both sides. And so fetal MRI also helps with twin pregnancy, although it can be very challenging due to position and um, the orientation of both the babies and just the um, fetal MRI uh, uh, reading process itself may be challenging. Now, um, whenever we counsel these uh, families, obviously, if you integrate it with the neonatal part when the baby is born, there's so many questions in the prenatal period, like what is the diagnosis, what caused this, um, what is the long term going to look like, is, uh, are they going to be independent, are they going to need special services, what is the kind of follow up, and so Families are profoundly stressed because there's also, while they know we, we discuss what's the information available, there's this whole element of unknown and uncertainty, whether who will be more mild to moderate on the spectrum and who will fall into the severe end. So this, uh, obviously, uh, we try our best to give them an understanding of what we know, share the uncertainties, and also give them hope and empower them especially when they are um, continuing the pregnancy and the baby is born, um, empowering parents and involving them in the care of the infant uh, can really help with the outcome. So looking at the variability in the counseling process, the challenges in prenatal imaging interpretation, how these evolve over time, um, we um, set up to um, develop a collaborative network. Um, this is the work um, I started about two years ago, uh, two, almost two and a half years for educational clinical collaborations and research collaborations because the field is so new. And uh, when we sent out a survey um, through all these centers, so these are uh, the pictures of all the centers we have. This, these are the collaborators. Uh, we worked together to create a fetal neurology practice survey. And this was sent out to all programs in the United States States to get the understanding of the practice of fetal neurology so we could um, uh, guide the program development, the guidelines, and the um, clinical and research collaborations. So um, these are the responses from the centers. They were variable numbers. Some centers were seeing about few in a year and some were seeing few in a week. So obviously the knowledge and expertise varies between the centers. Uh, if you look at the, in the response of these um, uh, fetal neurology survey, the gestational age was very variable. So it is usually recommended after 20 weeks. However, sometimes early MRIs were being done. And sometimes you see there's late referrals when uh, abnormalities are noted on a uh, later ultrasound. However, uh, the most uh, typical gestational age uh, is after the anatomy scan, which is done around 18 to 20 weeks, and then the fetal MRI is happening in that 20 to 21 weeks uh, window or a little later. Now, um, the common diagnoses are some of the ones uh, for which I presented the examples. So ventriculomegaly, Epsom septum pellucidum, midline agenesis of corpus callosum, posterior fossa anomalies, the cortical malformations, microcephaly, spinal anomalies, and the complex brain malformations. And then non-CNS consults can also be uh, seen in association. However, CNS uh, central nervous system diagnosis are the top indication for fetal MRI and fetal consulta neurology consultations are uh, rapidly increasing at various centers. Now, um, um, involvement of uh, genetic counselors and trainees for these consults was also very variable. About half were involving genetic counselors um, to some degree, and um, but, but a large number did not have any involvement of genetic counselor at the site. And at smaller centers, um, not every specialist may be available on the same day for these consultations. And uh, there's also a gap in trainee education because uh, Pediatric neurologists are graduating, not at every center they are getting to uh, learn how to do these fetal concerts. However, they may end up in a practice and end up seeing some on their uh, first month as they start as a faculty or attending. So training is very important. 
Um, genetic testing was very variable, gene panels, whole exome discussion. So genomics and whole genome has increasingly been used. And um, in just about the last, if I uh, look at my own practice in the last two, three months, I have had at least um, three new diagnoses by whole exome in the prenatal period where we went back and did the counseling again based on that particular genetic cause for the brain malformation. Postnatal follow-up is also variable between centers. Not all centers are doing uh, the formal developmental testing. Ages and stages questionnaire is used commonly. However, a majority are just doing clinical assessment by the pediatrician and the pediatric neurologist. And uh, loss to follow-up and um, challenges with follow-up is always there for these pregnancies. So the role of uh, having uh, registries and natural history um, collaborative networks is very important. And then in the survey, we asked about what are the um, uh, requirements that uh, participants who are in doing fetal neurology consultations, what would they like seen in the coming uh, months at conferences. So there was a uh, big demand for clinical guideline development, outcome studies, uh, more training on reading fetal MRIs, how to do a fetal consult, uh, discussion about prenatal genetics and ethics and palliative care and basic report uh, were also um, in the uh, topics. Now, um, these are, this is the um, one of the couple papers that we have um, brought out. One is especially a topical review. This is already out if you would like to download um, and read, uh, especially discussing the challenges in the field and what is the difficulty fetal neurologists and prenatal counselors, um, prenatal specialists fee, um, experience in prediction of the neurodevelopmental outcomes. And this is the survey study which has been accepted and will be out soon. And um, so the future guidance uh, based on our various um, meetings and talks has been um, that the fetal um, neurology consults are actually increasing with time. More um, fetal MRIs are being done when an abnormal ultrasound is um, uh, seen in pregnancy. So large scale outcomes um, data, natural history studies, um, are needed evidence to guide the evidence-based care. So the um, supporting collaborative networks uh, between programs, between countries to guide the guidelines and practice and, and also for curriculum development for trainees and for program development um, is the uh, what can make this field successful. Um, and because right now the care is very expert-based or center-based, and um, the collaborative network. This is just like the experience from our one single country. And if we go around looking between other countries, then obviously we will be sharing our knowledge and learning from each other. And um, um, so the fetal neurology, this early period is important um, in globally also with the sustainable goals by WHO regarding the uh, improvement of uh, maternal and uh, infant health, neonatal health. So really the care in the pregnancy and the first few years of life as we follow these uh, children uh, is really important and a good early diagnosis, uh, timely management prenatally, perinatally and postnatally and uh, connecting them, them with the right uh, rehabilitative support and therapies can really help improve the um, overall outcome. And so that's all. And this is just a picture of all the places that I've uh, started, starting out in Varanasi, I'm Institute of Medical Sciences, and then at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where I did the uh, high-risk OB MFM training and worked there as a faculty. And then um, at Texas Children's, where I when I moved to the U.S., and now I'm currently at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia here. So, I think I'll stop sharing, and then we can have enough time for uh, questions and discussion. Wow, and uh, it's, it's actually an amazing uh, description of something. I mean, uh, this very difficult topic made so simple. Uh, so may I request uh, the moderators to kindly take over uh, Dr. Somashri and the, uh, yeah, Dr. I don't see him here. Dr. Somashri, yeah. Yes, 
uh, uh, Dr. Akash, Akash is yeah. Yeah. He yeah. is not there. Okay. Yeah, he, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a wonderful talk, ma'am. So there are a uh, few questions in the chat box. So uh, mainly related to fetal MRI, basically. So mm -hmm. uh, one has asked about the indication of fetal MRI. So what are the suspicion at which point we should uh, actually advise for fetal MRI? Yeah, so um, whenever there is an abnormality on the ultrasound, um, now uh, many times we see MRI being done for isolated mild ventriculomegaly. You are seeing um, ventricles are 10 and 11 or and 11 on one side or 12 on one side. But because of the availability of the test and um, if whenever you counsel a patient based on ultrasound, uh, there'll be a high uh, acceptance that yes, we would opt for a fetal MRI for a better picture, right? To For a more informed counseling process. So it's increasingly being done. Um, I have maybe just counseled one patient based on ultrasound in the last two, three years. So majority of the patients, when they reach fetal neurologists, they have had a fetal MRI. And um, that's, uh, that's in, uh, included in the counseling process with the review of the imaging. Okay. So uh, although that is not in the chat box, but I am interested to know that uh, what you showed na, in your slide that there was some worsening colpocephaly at 23, 24 weeks then. So mm -hmm. is it an indication for termination? What you feel as you've shown, uh, as you have shown the outcome letter? So at this yeah. point, if the parents want uh, uh, counseling for the termination, so what will be your advice? So um, I think if decision-making is involved, we have done a second MRI also. However, for this family, they had already made up their mind and they said, okay, we'll wait for the postnatal uh, scan. They were, I think, already 32 weeks or so because, you know, the um, legal um, limits at every state, every country, it's different and it's not an easy process. Majority of who have gone to that stage around 28, 30 weeks will have already made up their mind and but uh, we have done second MRIs rarely it's not the standard practice but only when family is really insisting and wanting more information okay okay and uh, one more question on this fetal MRI that uh, what is the threshold for fetal MRI in ventricular megaly I mean uh, probably she or he has uh, mean to say that uh, how severe ventricular megaly uh, uh, will be worrisome to advise a fetal MRI at that point only? Right. So 10, 10 millimeter is the normal cutoff. So anything beyond 10, so 11 or more is usually referred for um, MRI. And um, as many times, you know, there's just an absent septum on ultrasound. So no ventricular megaly. That's another indication where we are seeing more and more of these um, um, patients being referred because that's just an indication that something is not developing right. So absent septum by itself may not be the problem, but there may be a forebrain malformation. So holoprosencephaly or missing corpus callosum. So that's why these families are then getting referred for a better picture, which is obtainable through the MRI. Okay. Um... So there is another question regarding fetal IVH. So the person has uh, wanted to know whether there is any genetic basis for that. So basically, he wanted to know that what are the differential diagnoses you will think about it. So why it had happened? And is there any genetic test you will advise at that point? Maybe right. uh, from termination point of view. Yeah. So IVH per se... Um... Uh, isolated IVH is less seen with the collagen. It's more when there is parenchymal and white matter injury also. And collagen mutations can cause kidney conditions. So they can have hydronephrosis. They can also have eye findings. So chorioretinal problems, uh, hemorrhages, uh, early cataracts. So uh, we had a baby who was born with cataracts and had IVH and tested um, for so collagen eye abnormalities, skin vessel ab abnormalities, um, and uh, kidney abnormalities have been noted. Now with the IVH question, I think um, IVH is more, um, okay, medication exposure, some um, 
uh, hemorrhagic um, factor deficiency, uh, toxic me uh, medication exposure, nate, neonatal uh, or fetal, neonatal allomune thrombocytopenia, they are being tested for that, uh, which is like the platelet uh, version of the RH. So similar, like the incompatibility that's associated. And then um, obviously when you are having this kind of a process that is causing hemorrhage, you could see injury in other end organs also. So, um, but cold 4 a per se is not um, associated with intestinal necrosis or ascites to answer that question related to the collagen. But there are gene panels. So whenever we suspect with parenchymal prenatal hemorrhages, uh, we um, can do the cold 4 a one and two panel and with the three, four other genes, and we don't have to go to the whole exome. And the testing result is also sooner. It comes in about three, four weeks, whereas the whole exome can sometimes take more than a month or, I mean, three, four months, unless you expedite it through uh, one month, then it takes one month. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I think there are a few more questions in the same thing that is fetal MRI and termination that you have already discussed. Uh, what are the conditions? So there's in the chat, I'm also reading. What are the conditions fetal MRI where you advise to terminate pregnancy? Yes, so that's yeah. uh, um, what are the conditions is, so whenever we see a diagnosis, you know, you have seen the variability of the spectrum. So we, the counseling process will lay out the spectrum of outcomes, the best case scenario, the worst case scenario. And, um, and then we involve the family in the decision-making. We will, um, like for holoprosencephaly, we'll um, uh, probably be more like, this is going to be more profoundly delayed intellectual disability, seizures, intractable seizures, and we will bring up termination. But for my, always for milder cases, you are going to just discuss the spectrum and involve the family in the decision making about what their perspective is. Some families with the slightest abnormality will want to um, go for termination, whereas others will be willing to continue. And so the decision making is tricky and uh, we lay out the possible outcomes and the option of termination, but the decision-making is obviously based on the family's own perspectives of what they perceive for their child. Uh, yeah. Dr. So, so one Dr. more Surinda. question on... Uh, Hello? Dr. Somushri, can yeah, I... Dr. Surinder, uh, you uh, want to ask them? Yeah, hi, Dr. Uh, Sonika. Namaskar. Kaise uh, I'll just tell Manoj my relation with her also. Okay. Um, let me tell also. She's our uh, Guru Bhair. She's daughter of my teacher and my wife's teacher, Dr. K. Nagarwal. Oh. Uh, illustri illustrious father who was the director of NCPGI and uh, who has done uh, brain MRI in children of anemia in 80s and 90s and done uh, brain iron studies in autopsies. Uh, of babies in that part, uh, in that era also. So there is a daughter, uh, a daughter of a father who has done uh, brain studies uh, with MRI and uh, brain iron studies way back uh, in 80s and 90s also. Thank you, Dr. So uh, Sonika. Uh, I wanted to keep it at the end and know that since I wanted to ask, uh, uh, Dr. Sonika, in India, here termination is very hard. And you have done more than that by 26 weeks also, by 26 weeks. Sab kar right. So it is not like in US that you don't get to see and people are forced to just carry on with the pregnancy. Then sometimes they not forced. It is not in their scheme of minds, events also, that they can they have the opportunity of terminating. So in India, like the questions are being asked, uh, is because we get our guiding people send us with even eight millimeter, 10 millimeter in the first, uh, this 18 weeks uh, to sound. And then they're asking to terminate karete, terminate karete. So obviously, uh, when is, how, till, if, if, even if you want to know, uh, what is the best time to repeat an ultrasound? Uh, next week or two weeks or four weeks, six weeks? Where is the time? Yeah. When, there is a window of now with the new MTT Act in India of uh, actually having a baby with no major malformation or major disability. Right, so... 
So um, the ultrasound or MRI, usually we wait at least two weeks to repeat it. Uh, I know the time window is very critical, but um, I was actually speaking with my um, colleague from Ames last week, and um, there was a recent amendment in the MTP Act, uh, which she shared, where uh, for anomalies, it is allowed even at a la later gestation through the discussion in a medical advisory board in the established in the hospital, right? And in US, obviously with the recent change in the law, it has been a, a big problem and patients are actually going ag across trade borders. Um, so um, it's a big challenge and an issue which um, is being advocated for, for change, um, but uh, we are still waiting for um, counseling patients and then uh, they are going to another state where the limit is higher. To so the MFMs and the OBs, they are guiding them. But typically, we would wait at least ten to fourteen days for a repeat scan to see for a, a, the anomaly again. If you are in doubt and if you think the decision making can be changed, uh, we have another question from Livert Flores. Uh, he, uh, Doctor Livert, has been with us for the last three years continuously, attending most of the webinars. Uh, he has wished you a good morning, good presentation. And the question is, if a pregnant woman has history and risk factors for brain malformation, after how many weeks you can request an MRI? So the best is to request around 20 weeks minimum because uh, earlier MRI, then you may have the posterior fossa, vermis, cerebellum, part of the corpus callosum, they are still forming. So um, an early MRI is not so helpful. Uh, you should at least uh, try to get it closer to 20 weeks. Dr. Somishri? Yes. There are lots of questions. Uh, I think this point is still not clear. They're asking the role of whole exome sequencing, the total panel of uh, genetic testing in case of I mean, ventricular megaly. So will you please elaborate, ma'am, on this regard? And also they are asking the relation of the genetic test with uh, some form of brain abnormality. Like they're thinking of maybe carpal kylosynergenesis may be associated with just some genetic uh, risk factors can be there. In case of NK, also there can be something there. So what will be the full panel of genetic tests we can advise if we see uh, such type of brain anomaly? Maybe right. for the next child, that will help. Yeah. Right. So um, uh, even in the current pregnancy, when you are seeing ventriculomegaly, uh, the Society of MFM um, in America, so they have recommended that all ventriculomegalies will uh, be um, recommended an amniocentesis. Now, the patient may choose not to do it, but the recommendation is amniocentesis with infectious testing, CMV, toxo, parvo, whatever. If you are suspecting some other, uh, then um, do that. And uh, karyotype and chromosomal microarray. So that's the minimum recommendation. And after that, if the counseling process starts, so if all those tests are negative, then with mild ventriculomegaly, we we'll say oh, 90% will have a favorable outcome. But in 10%, we always discuss that you're early in pregnancy and the cortex is still forming and there could be an undiagnosed cortical malformation or like with subtle dysmorphic features like genetic syndromes, you may not be able to always see on ultrasound and MRI, and we always can have a discordance between the prenatal and the postnatal testing. Now, um, looking at the panel, so whenever we are suspecting a particular genetic syndrome, then we go for that gene panel. So if we are thinking collagen 4A, then col 4A1 and 2, and or if there's hydrocephalus and aqueductal stenosis, then the um, L1 cam, the cellular adhesion molecule, so L1 cam gene mutation. So there's a hydrocephalus panel. We also have a brain malformation panel, which we do commonly postnatally, which has about um, several genes which are commonly seen associated with brain malformations. But over the years, the increasing trend is whenever we are seeing these babies postnatally, we are usually now going to whole exome to just get a better yield rather than doing a stepwise, uh, doing a panel and then getting to whole exome. So based on your availability and your 
um, putting together all the clinical information, the panel has decided. Yes. Uh, but now, maybe you are approaching antenatal arachnoid cyst. That is another question. Yeah, so arachnoid cyst. Arachnoid. The, yeah, they, they, are, they usually have a favorable outcome. So arachnoid cyst, if the brain is okay, it, they, they'll have a favorable outcome. However, I've seen big arachnoid cysts in the back, and then there's the cortical malformation underlying it. And that is uh, pressing on the brain stem and causing, going to need a shunt. The underlying brain is abnormal. So your counseling will be based on uh, the postnatal scan. How does the brain look uh, in the uh, uh, area under the arachnoid cyst? Now, someone has asked a question in the chat about possible movements in the fetus. So I did not include much of the basics of the MRI. So the way the MRI is done in fetal MRI is uh, these are shorter MRIs. They are 20 minutes. These are um, because we cannot sedate the mom and the baby is always moving. Uh, we typically will call the moms um, uh, fasting for four hours or so, as long as they can be in pregnancy. And that way the baby is usually sleeping and then rapid single slice acquisition of images. There are special sequences that are done. Most of these are um, T2 uh, like appearance. So you saw all the ventricles look like the T2 images on the postnatal scans. And then there is the GRE or susceptibility imaging for hemorrhages. And then, then we also take the diffusion restriction images. So it's a rapid sequence. Um, it's a single slice, which is merged and then uh, the images are red. So these are uh, shorter MRIs and these are motion limiting. So that's one of the limitations we discussed, the motor motion limitation, the um, uh, fetal positioning. So MRI helps over ultrasound for the fetal positioning part. But the motion part is actually the measurement of ventricular megaly can be more accurate on ultrasound. But the MRI is helping us with the evaluation of the parenchymal structures the cortical malformation, the white matter, the brain parenchyma, cerebellum, vermis. But because uh, the baby is moving, the, we, we go by the measurements on the ultrasound uh, and the ultrasound follow-up helps with the serial imaging for the ventricular megaly. Yeah. Well, there is one more question in the chat box that if there is prenatal diagnosis of interventricular hemorrhage, but uh, in the postnatal ultrasound, we see that it is absolutely normal. So uh, should we still advise for an MRI? In so, um, yes. Yeah, so if you, so you mean uh, you saw a fetal MRI with IVH? Yeah. And later, yes. yeah, there is nothing. Yeah. So the germinal matrix hemorrhage, right? You can see hemocedrin lining the ventricle. Mm -hmm. Um Many times, I think if the hemorrhage is significant on the fetal MRI, we usually will advise a postnatal MRI, especially to evaluate the aqueduct um, and just be sure if there's any hemocedrin or uh, blood that is causing fibrosis of the aqueduct and tightening, then whether we need a follow-up scan and how yeah, closely we monitor. Right, so how closely we monitor mm -hmm. the baby for the risk of hydrocephalus or shunt, that's important. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, anything? How common is torch infection and fetal brain yeah, pathology in your setup? Okay. So um, I think the common, um, the mm -hmm. uh, other of the torch is like really variable. So you obviously cannot test for every possible virus. The common test on amniocentesis that we are doing is the CMV, the toxo, um, or in the serum. And sometimes if you are suspecting parvovirus, we'll go there. Um, Zika is more, it was in that time when Zika in the endemic area, so Zika testing was done in those cases, but it's not always routinely done. So these are the two, three that are usually done, but we obviously, the other range is really big and we don't always test for every single of those tests. Hmm. And so usually with question. The, uh, to answer the question on the fetal brain pathology, right? So with toxo, with CMV, mm -hmm. you will see other findings of infection in the brain or liver, spleen, uh, microcephaly, other parts uh, being affected. So then we go more for looking for that uh, particular condition. 
So there is one more question that uh, whether the parents of pitters with uh, meningomyelocell but without hydrocephalus uh, can be counseled for termination. I think it's no, answer should be no, but still I want to hear from you. So for uh, myelomeningocele, um, there's um, surgery happening prenatally here um, in the yeah. US. So especially with the, yeah. the big mom's trial. So there's uh, prenatal surgery happening and uh, uh, at our fetal center, that's the biggest, one of the largest uh, number of patients who are delivered and prenatal surgery and they're being followed. There's a big cohort. So, and, and, and at several other centers also, but again, you have to base this counseling and the decision-making on, on the patient's pers perspective, where they are, what the, in that particular region, what the outcome will be and what we can do for that baby in that particular setting, right? So your counseling has to be individualized to that family, to that region, and looking at all the circumstances. So it, it will be a different discussion for every family. Yes. Yeah. So uh, just today I have uh, attended a, a medical, uh, you know, uh, there was a medical team. So regarding a mother who is just uh, 22 weeks is having a plastic anemia and severe cytopenia. So the platelets are uh, within 10,000 only. <laughs> And there she is getting, she is under some treatment like cyclosporin and all, and is getting a platelet transfusion, maybe alternate day she's symptomatic, bleeding from the gum, hematuria, hematomasis. So they were asking for the neonatal outcome. I saw the anomaly scan till 22nd week, it is absolutely normal. But uh, still in this case, we advise to continue pregnancy. So what will be your advice? Should we do a fetal MRI or like that to, I think, to exclude uh, hemorrhage? Because there is a, a very likely possibility that the maternal count is only 10,000. Right. So um, you could start with ultrasound. And if ultrasound is a very good, it's always the best first line test. If the ultrasound is abnormal, then only we go to fetal MRI. Fetal MRI is a complementary test to the ultrasound. It does not replace the ultrasound. So I would still start with the ultrasound um, and um, then consider MRI. If you have any suspicion, ultrasound can pick up hemorrhage. It's good for picking up hemorrhage for ventriculomegaly. And then if you have suspicion, then go for the fetal MRI. Okay, ma'am, uh, there's a question on choroid plexuses. It is quite a common finding. Often we get... Okay. Yeah, so choroid so, plexuses. Uh, yeah. So they are they are commonly seen. Majority yeah, so will disappear. Majority will disappear by the term yeah. uh, or by six months of age. Um, but they will end up having a fetal MRI or, or MRI at birth. But usually the prognosis is good. Very rarely the choroid plexus, hyperplasia or other abnormalities uh, have been report, reported with the trisomies and tetrasomies, but yes. usually choroid plexus test overall will have a good prognosis. Someone has their hand raised. So in case uh, we gave Do you want to let them ask the question? Dr. Tarek? Or oh, maybe an error, okay. Choroid plexus. I saw another question here in the Q and A that I was going to answer. I'm just going through the list. Uh, so, what would be the indications for whole exome? For example, corpus callosum anomalies may be associated with various metabolic disorders, including non-ketotic hyperglycinemia. Yes. So, um, with the corpus callosum, we when we counsel them, we counsel them about the. 20 to 30 percent risk for association of uh, genetic or metabolic disorders. And then uh, if family opts for the whole exome, then we will obviously, but we cannot test for every possible metabolic disorder prenatally. And um, so usually we will be um, doing the whole exome through the amnio if family agrees and opts for it.
Yeah, Dr. Manoj, probably we have uh, covered all the questions. So, uh, do you like to ask anything else? No, I think I don't see anything in the YouTube as well. Uh, so, uh, and, and it was such a wonderful session, brief, and then we had an overview of whatever hap ha uh, happens uh, during that amazing period of growth. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sonika. And I, we have the Secretary General of uh, NNF, Dr. Surinder Bisht here. Uh, I would request him to propose a word of thanks for this session. Uh, thank you, uh, Manoj. Uh, so, Mushi, Akasha has left, and I think Dr. Haridam and Pratash are there. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, uh, to have Dr. Sonika Agarwal, uh, who I is for me like an elder sister because she is the daughter of my teacher, a guru behen for that matter. And I've, um, I've as a postgraduate, I attended your marriage and I worked for your marriage also <laughs> that day. Yeah, I'm reminded of that. And I'm uh, many a times, uh, because uh, uh, the it, even our houses are very close to each other only. So we are living in the same sector only. So uh, uh, given that, uh, it was a very nice um, uh, lecture and uh, Dr. Sonika, this is the third time I'm listening to you in the last one year here, one for NQCN and one for other. And this is the third time. And every time your slides are very, very different. In fact, this time it was a very different presentation from what I have yeah. heard from so uh, from NQ, NQCN. And the example, the the cases were so interesting. In fact, uh, for a common NNF member, uh, just to have a data is not a good thing. They need to see the real life actually as a hota hai, aise cases aate hai, and agar hamare paas aayenge to hume kaise karna hai. So this kind of experiencing, experiential learning was there, and then there was a uh, academic uh, kind of a survey of whole of uh, uh, North America, you can say, uh, if not uh, USA, where you have made a collaboration, and there they you can know how what is the kind of a training uh, level involvement in the programs and how at what gestation they are do coming, at what gestation they are getting the MRI. All those experiences uh, are very well researched and uh, shared by uh, with all of us in India, and I think all of the uh, viewers who are. Uh, Listening to and watching it uh, over the um, over over the Zoom platform. Uh, thank you all, and uh, I think uh, uh, on behalf of National Hotel Forum, it is our uh, great honor to have have you on this uh, the platform. And Manoj, you have got the best of speakers. And I mind you, Mr. Kero, Madam, Mr. ये आपका नाम Manoj ने अपने आप ही कहीं कहीं से ढूंढा था. I have nothing to do with it. So, <laughs> so your name uh, for this platform as the uh, the the highest level of uh, you can say Indians who are working uh, abroad and working in uh, so he found it and he searched it and he, he got your name and I was very happy that Mujhe Kuch Kera Nahi Pada Manoj already had a very good, good name uh, search Manoj you have found the best of all these series which is coming every time but it is one score above the other it is, it is just building up the kind of a moment uh, you can say the you know, I think uh, it, the stage is set uh, thank you all and so uh, much please and uh, the certification card the now you are getting uh, certified uh, for these uh, uh, credit hours also and people are asking for certificate also and a uh, mm -hmm. lot of people have asked for certificates and I request all to uh, they can collect the certificates uh, from Somushi and or NNF Thank you, thank you all. Manoj Lapat. Thank you, thank you, uh, Surender. Now, uh, 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 before we close for today, I would like to invite you again for our next uh, session. Uh, it is going to be next week, not after two weeks, as is the usual practice. And we go on to something that was uh, briefly alluded to in today's talk, the role of genomics. And, uh, and it's not perinatal care, it's neonatal care this time and then further research. And the faculty is uh, Professor Pangaj Agarwal, again from USA. We have a, a list of uh, topics uh, arranged for this year. We have shared all the topics uh, uh, here. So I would uh, invite all of you to join again uh, next week for the next session. So until then, with all your permission, we'll close for today. Special thanks to Dr. Sonika. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So nice to see you all.